Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for coming along. Welcome to this lunchtime seminar. I'm very delighted to welcome our guest speaker, Jim Walker, Chief Executive of the Outdoor Trust, and he's also a serial social entrepreneur of several kinds of organisations. One of his other hats that he wears, he's, he's director of Walk 21, which is an international consultancy offering advice about livability to the mayors of cities worldwide. So Jim has got some great stories to tell about advising cities like Bogota, for example. Now, <clears throat> the very simple act of walking has got quite a lot to do, it seems, with the very complex topic of sustainability, and quality of life, well-being. But how do we go about promoting walking? Because it potentially could be part of the answer to all sorts of problems to do with air pollution, climate change, obesity, lack of connection with the great outdoors. How do we go about promoting walking in what are often very hostile policy environments and very hostile urban settings as well, where cars, old infrastructures, old attitudes make it very hard to conceive of walking as the solution to many of the problems that we face. Well, we can have anybody better to try and answer those questions than Jim. So great to have you here, Jim. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for coming. Um, I, uh, it was a privilege to meet Ian actually a, a few months ago. Uh, at a seminar which, where we were talking about biodiversity, I think, right. and how to get people better connected to the outdoors. Uh, and we seem to find ourselves on the same page very quickly in, uh, in recognising it's a bit about people, it's a bit about the outdoors, and, and getting that mix right isn't necessarily a, a science, it's a bit of an art, it's, it's probably a bit of all of those things. And I thought um, I'd really very happy to be able to share with you my story about how I've sort of tried to dance between those two things, of it being that art or science. I've got a degree in um, uh, environmental management uh, at Manchester, actually, which was looking at, believe it or not, BSc. However, at, uh, at A-level, I did art. And, uh, you know, my, my parents have never quite understood how I can be all about people and interested in talking on the people side of things. And somehow or other, uh, I've had to learn about how things work uh, and how to deliver projects as well on the ground. That seems to be the sort of conversation we've had and I, I think something that I've really appreciated over the years in my connections with uh, the university here in Surrey uh, because I've been involved in several projects and I think you've got a really good reputation of being able to make sense of, of those relationships, that interrelationship. Uh, I've done projects here uh, with you guys on uh, conflict between walkers and cyclists, trying to work out is there any uh, and if there is, how do we make it better? Uh, I've done projects here about uh, making sure the outdoors is, is more accessible to people, whatever their ability, uh, and how we are proactive to, to make the outdoors relevant to people uh, of all different faiths, uh, nationalities, um, and different backgrounds. Um, and I've been very grateful for the fact that even just announcing that I was coming here, some people have sent me some fantastic papers, which proved to me uh, if I was, if I was uh, being maybe slightly rude, that uh, there is a theory behind my life's work of madness, uh, which has been some sort of it's sort of gut reaction, sort of practical things that you know the outdoors is a lovely place and you feel better when you've been in it. But somehow or other, you guys have proved it, and I'm very grateful that you have. It's very helpful when I'm in political meetings and they say, "Can you prove it?" and I and I wave one of your papers, or even just have to mention your name. And that's actually helped me, so thank you. And, and I'm going to leave you uh, at the end of today with uh, a request for one more bit of research that I really, really need because people keep asking me for it. So if that hopefully holds on, holds on uh, your attention, I'm going to ra rapidly race through a quick life story because I felt as an introduction, Ian's already said he's happy to have me back, believe it or not, and I haven't even started yet. I thought if I just give you a sort of scene setter of where I've come from and how I got here, I think there's some relevance here. I hope there is, about some of the themes uh, and some of the things I think might be helpful to be able to apply su successful future projects uh, in partnership here with the, with the university. So first off, here's me, Big Boy's Guide to the Great Outdoors. And you know, there is that sort of scene, isn't there? You sort of imagine that the outdoors is, is quite hairy, it's quite intimidating, um, but it's there to be conquered and for man to feel his place. And, uh, you know, I think that, that, that package is still something that's promoted. Uh, it's still something that's sold by outdoor manufacturers, kit, kit people, basically. You know, it doesn't make much sense to me that you can go into 
uh, I think it's a Cotswold shop in, or, or it's Alice Brigham in, in Covent Garden. You can climb in an ice wall at the back of their shop. Uh, you can buy, and lots of people do, buy a jacket which will take you down to minus 35, and people are wearing these things on the tube. Yeah. Uh, but, yet, but in understanding sort of why is that, why are people choosing to do that, uh, I think is really what's quite interesting. And so I wanted to sort of start with a, with a conversation about this, this image and, and working out how the appeal of that macho stuff really did get me early on. Not many people have seen this photograph. <laughs> uh, but here I was and I thought, you know, yeah, that is it. Being outdoors, I might get a badge one day. You know, crikey, I could even get a hat. Uh, I really liked just playing outdoors. You know, this was me about seven. Uh, and I thought it was just the thing to do. And dressing up is absolutely fantastic. It's something I've often done and uh, continue to do. And yet, you know, the campaigns that are out there now would suggest to you, I don't know if anyone's seen this uh, uh, Project Wild thing, fantastic movie, well worth uh, going to have a look at it or downloading a video or anything, but it was a guy who was uh, nervous, he was a market, marketing exec and saying, my kids don't want to go outdoors anymore, uh, and he made a movie about it. And uh, there was this sort of sense that uh, kids don't want to go out, that somehow or other they're being uh, protected, we're protecting them from wanting to enjoy it as much as we did when we used to dress up and uh, run around with cat guns. Uh, I don't know too much about that, and we could have a whole session on that, I, I think. What is fascinating, and I think the bit that I can tell you factually, is that the environmental sector, in my opinion, has got massively fragmented as it has grown over the last 20 years. Uh, and it's got competitive with that growth. And what's happened here is that when you put a child back into the middle of the, of the, uh, the whole campaign, the whole story about getting back outdoors and appreciating it, we've got over 1,500 different organisations signed up saying, I know there's something in it that's bigger than me as my organisation. And I think, that's, I think that would be an interesting study to sort of see where it goes next. And this is where I went next. But by the time I was 15, so I've just doubled my age, lost my gun, I uh, haven't got my hat, still got my knock knees though. <laughs> and I did Duke of Edinburgh Award. You know, uh, I had that sort of connection which uh, was stopping me being bored, rigid, which I remember saying, you know, that oh, I'm bored conversation that um, I had with my parents. And, and I did this scheme and I thought it was just great to be out and about, you know, mainly because no one was telling me what to do. Uh, and I think it's worth remembering some of those points that are not necessarily it was all about being out and about. It was the fact that somebody wasn't telling me that I had to take this path or go in that direction. You know, I could be out and about on my own or with just a bunch of mates for five days uh, and having a bit of fun. But much as that uh, you would imagine is still possible and Duke Edinburgh Ward is incredibly popular, you know, we have created some of these boundaries, uh, some of these barriers, which I think are, are quite difficult for us to, to feel culturally that we can overcome them on a regular basis. You know, things like this, uh, this was a quote here uh, from the All Party uh, group uh, about Scouts, which was talking about getting connected into um, supporting young people to be outdoors more. It, you know, even the local cub group where I am, people are putting their names down before they conceive, believe it or not. You know, they are, there's a waiting list of nine years to get into our local cub group because they can't find the leaders who are willing to actually run the, the projects. And, and that isn't because they sort of feel, well, I don't know what to do. They are nervous, to say the least. Um, about the, the thought that they might do something wrong. They're not quite sure how to get it right. And, uh, you know, I think sort of getting this balance uh, is going to be important as we think through where this is all going 10 years, ten years time. So this is me another 10 years later. <laughs> You're seeing the whole family album here, but uh, it, not many people have seen these. But this is me. I, I qualified in environmental management at, um, at Manchester, as I say. This is, this is me, the scientist, believe it or not. But I, I was, I, I learned all this stuff about the outdoors and realised that actually, to my disappointment, most, most of it's man-made. Most of it is a, a relatively surreal landscape where we are working out how we fit in based on someone else's opinion of how they think we should be fitting in. Whether that's in an urban situation or rural as you sort of might 
uh, very quickly distinguish, but more realistically in that sort of jumbled mix of whether we've got a mixed woodland or, you know, we've got uh, sycamore trees, you know, but they were imported by the French, you know, or whether, you know, therefore they're not native and therefore we shouldn't really have them. And, you know, there was this whole sort of, um, this whole world that was, that was really getting to me, really, about what was right and what was wrong about the outdoors. And so I went to Iceland. I went to the place that I thought was probably the most natural, most untouched, as much as possible, raw landscape. And, uh, and it was. It was, it was really, really rough. And I walked around, it, I walked around the circumference of it on my own, uh, aged 20, 19 years old or something, and uh, nearly died several times. But it was a, a very committed moment for me. And I, and I think what I, what I particularly am trying to share is the fact that there comes a point, I think, and not everybody gets an, an opportunity to find that time of, of being okay on your own. You know, but uh, being able to like yourself uh, and know yourself enough to actually work out what's important to you and what you want to do with your life and those sorts of things, I think is, is, is lovely to have that moment. Not everybody gets it. Some people don't get it ever. Uh, but I was very fortunate to have created that moment in a place where I knew it had to be as raw as possible for me to be able to let go of all those other things that were influencing in my head. Uh, and so the fact that, you know, for instance, there I was uh, working as a ranger previously, um, and people were asking me to look after deer, and, uh, you know, Heather was lovely. In, in other countries where I've been, uh, worked as a ranger in, uh, in New Zealand, for instance, you know, all these things, Heather needs to be eradicated and, and deer need to be shot. And you sort of think, where do we all fit in in this? You know, I, I thought I was brought up to love these things, and actually, in other places, they're not appropriate. And, and I, I, I must say, simple though it was, I was getting a bit confused. But what really, uh, really did resonate to me was the fact that scientist or artist, you know, boy or man, it was about being happy. And I felt happier when I had that connection, when I was outdoors and when I was in, you know, out there a bit more and more social with people. Not necessarily when I was just on my own, uh, but I, I, I was happy with other people too. This, if it's to be believed, and I know people in Surrey actually have written books about the happiness of Oxford. Um, if you're in the room, please don't shout at me too much if this is an old style or even yours. But, uh, but the point being that not everybody is necessarily generically happy. And there is a relationship between people's, uh, between each other uh, and their environment, which I think does influence uh, their, their happiness. Uh, and there are people like Dr. Catherine O'Brien in Vancouver who, who runs uh, PhD courses on happiness. Uh, and it's interesting to see who's going on those courses and how they unpackage that and repackage people being active, being social, being outdoors as a way to sort of have that connection to improve that happiness rating uh, and emotional uh, sense of well-being. I worked as a ranger, I worked on the North Downs Ways, which is why I know this bit of uh, Surrey, and in fact the, uh, the route to, goes just the other side of the cathedral here, uh, and so I knew Surrey quite well, I learned to, um, I did my chainsaw course at Mary's Wood, just down the wood, it's lovely to come past there, nearly 30 years later. Uh, and, and I really enjoyed being in urban situations where I was connecting with people. In fact, I got pretty bored when I was just sitting there um, and only, it was just me. I had a lovely fit dog, but, um, and I was a lot healthier than I am now. But uh, it, it wasn't about just being out there on my own. It wasn't about learning the Latin species for me. It was about being able to communicate it. And I thought, if other people aren't out there enjoying it with me, then I'm not sure why... I'm doing it. It wasn't enough for me. And, and my life changed when this happened, which was the foot and mouth campaign. And, and this was my first memorable moment that needed marking with something meaningful. I'm not sure I'll remember how to say that except again, but there'll be three or four of these that I, I think is worth uh, recognising because when you see a meaningful moment about to happen, or maybe it's just happened, I think it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's an opportunity to imagine what we could create after that that could be on our agenda about getting people better connected to the outdoors. Um, when foot and mouth hit, it suddenly made people realise that everything that they assumed was working perfectly, that balance between people working, living, visiting the countryside, 
wasn't quite there anymore. And in fact, people stopped going. And it, it, it was very nice of the government because I was sort of in marketing and doing, uh, managing national trails, promoting people to go outdoors. Um, and not many people were in that space that they said, can you try and get people back outdoors? Because they're not going. Um, people won't go to the countryside and we're absolutely, we don't really know how to make it any better. Um, and so, you know, rightly or wrongly, I mean, I don't know how old I was, maybe 28 or something, but I came up with this campaign about, you know, the welcome mat, and in fact I was given helicopters uh, to go and cut in the grass uh, in fields over the back end of Surrey somewhere, the words welcome, you know, we planted it with wildflower mix and we took photos, we put things in every national newspaper, um, we got people back out there. And I thought, ah, oh, this was lovely. I like being important, if only for about 23 days. But I was really, I was important for, for a moment there when the economy needed me. You know, the country thought, we've got to get people back out there. And if they're not going automatically, it starts making you think, well, why, are they, why aren't they going automatically? Uh, or are people going automatically anyway after the foot and mouth crisis is finished? Just got you thinking, maybe a little bit differently, about how things work. Um, and I had a, a second meaningful moment, um, memorable moment, was um, post Pinochet. Uh, you guys who know Chile, uh, when Pinochet left, was kicked out, uh, I'm afraid my political history isn't fantastic, but uh, Pinochet was not a very nice guy uh, by all sense and purposes. He was taking you know, huge communities of people and uh, flying them out over the sea and dropping them out of planes. You know, it was, it was pretty horrific stuff. The community was broken, suffice to say, whatever your political opinion may be of it all. And uh, the British Embassy asked if I would go out because the country had this idea to unify the, all these fractured, broken communities with a trail going through the Andes. And they said, if we could build a trail that started somewhere down in Tuero de Fuego, you know, this is uh, Argentina and the sort of Falkland Islands down here, coming up all the way through the Atacama, you know, we think that that would connect the country back together. And, and it would be a lovely thing for us not to use any machines, but for, for the, every community locally to build it by hand. And I was like, crikey, across the Andes? <laughs> Have you been to the Andes? Uh, the Atacama Desert is the driest place on earth. You can't actually get across it and carry as much water as you need to actually get over it. You, you just can't do it. Um, this glacier down here has only been crossed twice. Uh, and then, if, as if that wasn't enough, the, the, the border with uh, Argentina is landmined. <laughs> you know, so I was like, but you know, if you want a trail, who am I to say we don't do a trail? It was a symbolic gesture, but the trail exists. Uh, and what was so amazing was that every community I went to, they were out there literally building this thing. And they still are today, realising it was something that brought them together. Uh, and my next meaningful moment uh, was, was when Princess Diana died. And I know I'm being a bit random here, with, you know, but it's just my life. <laughs> but this is, this is something that happened that after Princess Diana died, people said, actually, we've got all these flowers keep coming to the gate. Um, we're not quite sure but the country wants somewhere to go. They want some sort of route or something. And I, I developed the Diana Walkway, which you can still do around, around the parks, by identifying about 10 or 15 mini, meaningful places, mostly children's playgrounds, the Peter Pan statue, you know, the uh, pirate ship in Hyde Park, if you know it, uh, the place where Diana lived in Kensington Gardens. And there were places that w could have done with a bit of a facelift. We packaged them all together. We applied for some lottery funding, and we put in a walkway that is fantastically popular as uh, somewhere that was like a sort of pilgrimage, I suppose, a sort of modern day uh, St. Jacques de Compostela sort of route that allowed people to sort of mourn. Um, and something very similar happened during 9-11, you know, after 9-11 I got rung up, believe it or not, by the CIA, who said, you know, we want to do a trail that connects up all the sites where, um, it, you know, we've had these uh, atrocities. And, and I looked at it on the map and I said, I just don't think you can you know, I don't know if you remember, there was about five or six different sites. It, it didn't seem quite appropriate, it didn't, it didn't come off anyway, but, um, it, you know, there is obviously something at, at, at uh, the ground zero point now, but uh, it is interesting who rings and how trying to capture the mood of the nation and, and, uh, and, and give people something packaged in a way that 
is relevant to their lives has been something that it is something I've done quite a lot of and um, it has been fantastically rewarding if not slightly challenging sometimes and, and what I realized when uh, I, I started getting into this sort of these sort of more reactive situations it is that there's actually quite a big business behind the outdoors um, this is a, a recent report actually I just dropped it in here because you know the actual the size of the outdoor recreation industry uh, in total is about 664 what are they thousand dollars billion dollars sorry annual consumer spending uh, but what you've got quite a, a, a disjointed uh, connection between charities uh, who are out there saying please go in the outdoors a bit more and you know please look after it a bit better organizations who are charging a fortune to go and see places or enjoy those experiences like um, go ape you know out in the woods or uh, maybe treasure trails or something around the town and equipment <coughs> manufacturers who would like you to buy that 35 minus 35 uh, jacket and the, and the nice pair of 250 pound boots it, you know in in other countries particularly in the states they've sewn that together a bit more and it made me think actually there is a there is a business side of this which is, which is maybe quite interesting, that it would be worth thinking about who is that market? Who are those people and, and what is it that they want? And could we understand that bit better so that we are packaging it and benefiting from it? Because there's clearly money being spent in it. Uh, and I would say there's more money being spent in it in the UK than maybe almost anywhere else in the world. Uh, but if you look at the membership of the Ramblers Association, in terms of the walking market, I would say they've got less than 1%. Um, and so, Maybe the, the answer isn't a, a society or a club or something. Maybe it's something else. But what, what is that? Uh, I set up something called the Access Company, and there are about 15 of us, and we, we worked with people like you to, uh, to try and work this out and think about what the business side of it was. And if we were running it as a, as a business, who is our market? And we did some work uh, in the uh, early 2000s, which were thinking that, okay, not everybody is up for the outdoors. Not everybody is, going, is sitting there desperate to leave their car behind and, and connect better with nature. Um, but we reckon that there's, uh, there's a huge percentage of people who are doing it quite a lot or uh, certainly have an affinity to the outdoors. Uh, and when we were thinking of it specifically in relation to where we might develop more trails or uh, where we could get people, uh, more people engaged in the trails that already existed, we thought there's actually quite a lot that could be done. And actually thinking of it in this way, like you were Mr. Coca-Cola and you were trying to sell uh, your sticky brown fluid, you know, it's a matter of like, does anybody want this thing? Because I've made it and it, it's lovely once you've had it, I've just got to get you to taste it. Or is it actually just thinking about uh, what is it that people might want first? Uh, and, and is the answer a sticky brown, uh, gassy uh, drink? Or actually, would they really prefer Ribena? Um, and I think the environmental sector has probably played a bit of that game uh, all the way through in the last 15, 20 years uh, of imagining that we're trying to give them what, we, what they want, but actually we've got this thing. Uh, so I'd rather you have that. Uh, and you know, what I, I remember flippantly saying to, uh, when well, I used to look after some woods actually down in Bracknell, not far from here, and I said, uh, and my, uh, my boss said to me that, you know, we have to give users what they want. This is all about customer care and customer service. And, customer understanding and I was working in the sports department at the time and I said well look to be honest with you a lot of the people who are using my woods are not the sorts of people that uh, I would want to mix with my children or, or anything else the people that are using my woods are, are doing it for all sorts of things that I don't think we should be providing services for mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. it was flippant at the time but you know this stuff still happens and you sort of, if you're really going to take customer care service properly you probably end up with condom machines uh, not dog poo bags yeah. or some balance between the two uh, and I, I say, I know it sounds flippant, but you know, where do we, where do we make that decision then? How do we respond to uh, what's going on and what we would like to support? And how do we get that balance right? And, and what we found was uh, in, in the different markets that there were different needs, nothing unsurprising. Uh, the, the numbers are massively important. The point being, really, that once you start thinking about people and start talking to people rather than just making assumptions for them, you recognise that how people are currently spending their budget might not actually be appropriate to what it is people are asking for or where they, where they put their values. You know, the, the, the amount of money that Natural England was spending on national trails, as an example, it's only just one example, most of it 
is spent nearly half of it on cutting the grass, just keeping the paths open. But actually, what they've said was, if you want more people to do anything other than walk end-to-end -end on the Pennine Way, or the North Downs Way, as, as I was looking after, and only 1% of people are doing that, if you want more people to enjoy all the other bits as well, it's not just about cutting the grass. We maybe need to improve the amount of services, um, accommodation, cash points, places to sit, toilets, you know, and, and actually package things up in, in a way that is more appealing to people. It, it, it doesn't mean that that's how you do it, it how, how everybody immediately changed their budgets, but it was a theory, I suppose, or it was putting business type approaches into an understanding about how you might want to change uh, the management system uh, for parks, trails, uh, the promotion of, of the commodity, which is the actual, the outdoors. Um, I was asked to uh, develop the countryside code because what, what, what was recognised, again probably about 10 years ago now, maybe 8 years ago, was that as a, as a standard piece of text, it was different for almost every organisation. Um, whether you were English nature, a na managing a nature reserve, a national park, and in fact even between the national parks, everyone had their own different code. And as a user, coming back to that point about thinking about what people want and how they're engaged with the outdoors, uh, they were getting so many things you can do, things you can't do type approaches that it was getting difficult. Um, we worked and explored something like 40 different countryside codes that were out there. And there's still loads out there today. You might find probably four or five just in Guildford, I suspect, if you, if you looked around. Uh, between the waterways people and the, uh, the parks people, uh, maybe CTC down the road, you know, uh, people have got their own systems. And they're all meaningful, well meaningful. But what it seemed to boil down to, and the logo we came up with was about respect, protect and enjoy. It was something quite basic and it wasn't authoritarian. It was just really trying to get people to appreciate each other. And the work that I, uh, I did here in, in, with Surrey University was so often came down to this word respect respecting each other and respecting the environment that you're in. And actually, and, and probably this is true about so much of life, that if you get that right, um, the world is a better place. Um, and and we, we chose this uh, to work with Wallace and Gromit. This is uh, maybe one of, the, one of my moments, is, is recognising that you're out there telling people what not to do or how to do it in the outdoors. But, put it across in a cartoon character which has that national appeal um, and people listened and we had those same sorts of organisations who hadn't been talking to each other over the years and been going off in their own different direction doing their own things uh, came together and took responsibility for one countryside code across England, Scotland and Wales um, and it, it made me feel uh, that I haven't seen anything like that since apart from that Project Wild thing when I said those 1,500 organisations have come together. That makes me think, you know, whether it's animals or children, there are moments where people will come together and recognise that this makes sense, that we've got to, we've, we're all on the same page and we're doing things. I, I wonder if there are other moments that we could inspire uh, to help make things work. Um, one thing, I, I was working in London at the time, um, working at the City of London, uh, and Ian mentioned that, you know, with another hat on, I was working for uh, the mayor as an advisor about sustainable transport. Uh, and I suppose this sort of dialect changes that I've been through, having been a ranger, you know, I was very happy to dress up, as you know, whether it was a gun and a hat and a, and a little uh, sheriff badge, or put on a suit and actually walk around the city. Uh, I was happy to play those games and actually learn the dialect that said, if it's about transport, we need to provide networks where people can walk even in the city. Uh, during foot and mouth, my experience was that people were coming from the countryside into London and saying, where can we walk? Because the countryside is closed. And uh, the mayor had remembered that and said, well, we have got these old trails, you know, but we haven't really, they don't join up across political boundaries. Uh, and I don't know if people remember, uh, again, 80s and 90s, but people were managing cycle networks very often across political boundaries. They were stopped at roundabouts because, oh, that's someone else's responsibility there. Uh, and so you found it as a cyclist, quite frustrating that routes weren't up to a standard uh, across, across all the lines. This particular route, and the reason why I've got this slide up, this is 1977. Um, I'm sure you know who that is. Uh, but this was the first urban 
trail in the world happened in London. It took the principles, and the guy who actually invented it was a guy called Max, um, I didn't want to say Max Hastings, but I don't think it's been in the news, it was Max uh, Nicholson, who helped set up the RSPB and the Wildlife yeah. and Wetlands Trust. He was an environmentalist, and uh, he said, look, if I call it the Max Nicholson way, <laughs> I might have, it might survive a year. That I'll, I'll get rid of maybe 20 books, um, but you know it may never happen. But he loved being out in the outdoors, mostly in uh, Gloucestershire and you know in the wetlands and, and looking at birds. Uh, but he thought, why don't we do an urban trail? And in 1977, when the Queen was having a silver jubilee, um, she said, "Fantastic idea! You can give it my name. Uh, if we can join up the best bits of London life." Uh, that would be a great legacy for my Silver Jubilee. And um, so the great and the good came together, and we could have lots of talks about these sorts of things, about how, how to make these things happen. But they got the guy in charge of um, theatre, the people who were in charge of the roads, and the person in charge of uh, the underground. You know, the people who were basically running the show in, in London at the time. Uh, they invited them to a meeting at Buckingham Palace, and uh, within a year, this route was on the ground. Uh, and these sorts of markers, silver markers, has anyone actually seen them in the ground? Mm -hmm. in London, where they're, they're, they're all around London. That route is still very much there. And I thought, when I was working there, I thought, what is that route? You know, is anyone actually thinking about it or looking after it? And could it inspire any other routes? And in fact, I, I went to the mayor, put a package of paths together, which uh, included this, uh, 150 mile route, which is called the London Loop, going around the out, out of London. Uh, the Capital Ring, which is a sort of inner circle, that was the Jubilee Walkway here. The Greenway, which I'll talk about in a minute, the Green Chain and the Thames Path, that said we could create an urban network of walks here in London, which would be more than any other city in the world. Uh, we could give, we could make sure that 90% of people would be within a 10 minute access to one of these paths, and they could learn or appreciate at least go out and have a nice walk on, on something that was up to a quality, a defined quality standard. Wouldn't that be fantastic? Somehow or other, I managed to get nine million pounds off him, and uh, over a nine year period, we did 14,000 improvements, and we found that network was complete. Nobody particularly talks about it, because it's walking and it's recreation, and that's not the mayor's core business, and it's not what, he hasn't got a department for it. Uh, but again, we can have a discussion about that. Um, while I was doing that, though, uh, this happened. Do you know what that is? 20 Olympics. It wasn't that long ago. It feels, feels like a long time ago now. What exciting that that was, the reality was, another meaningful moment, in, as far as I'm concerned, the reality was everyone was pooing themselves, so forgive my uh, language, but they thought London is already full. You know, the transport system is going to stop. Mm. We need people to walk and cycle. And they thought, but the reality is, all the hotels are over in the west, and all the venues are in the east, and the thing is going to grind to a halt. And the biggest fear they had, and they nearly lost it to the French, uh, was about the fact that uh, people, the, the athletes who've been training for five, six, seven years, for this particular one minute moment, might not actually even make it to the stadium. So they made all sorts of rash promises in the bid that said, uh, that they will keep cars at 35 miles an hour from their hotel all the way to the door of the games in, in Stratford. They wrote that down and they promised it. And they said, you know, we'll do whatever it takes in order to maintain that constant speed across London. The average speed in London is 11 miles per hour for cars, okay? So just to promise a continuous 35 miles per hour was going to be quite something. The, the other thing they forgot to mention in the bid uh, was the fact that there was going to be this Diamond Jubilee uh, in this same year. Yeah. And in fact, it, it got quite political in that uh, they, had to, they had to ignore it in the bid. Uh, I'm telling you things here, my, my gosh. <laughs> Something remembered about the camera. But uh, they, they, they had to ignore it because they didn't want uh, any compromise between what was, um, what needed to be a very strong bid all about the games and wasn't going to weaken the brand. However, we couldn't let 60 years being on the throne get in the way uh, of an Olympic Games, and we had to find a way of connecting those two things. Well, at the time I was managing that walkway, 
uh, the Jubilee walkway, and I got it into a new lease of life, uh, ready for the uh, the 40th anniversary of the Queen's reign. And, but I thought maybe this is this is a moment where we do need a new trail. Maybe we need a trail that connects up with Buckingham Palace, um, with Kensington Palace, and all the hotels in the west of London, with all the venues, all those little triangles on there. I know they're small, but all those triangles are against time venues. And actually, there's a perfectly accessible route up through the parks, along the Grand Union Canal, uh, down through Beckton Park, along the Green Green Chain, Woolwich Foot Tunnel, and back along the Thames Path, which would conveniently create a 60 kilometre route, one kilometre for every uh, every year that she drained. And we could create that route. So what did I do? I, I, I remembered that moment of 1977, not that I was there, I was still in shorts with my cap gun at the time, I think. But, uh, I got the right people together in London, we hosted a meeting at Buckingham Palace and uh, within a year we'd created a budget of nearly £2 million, put this route in on the ground and the Queen came out for the, only the third time, came out her front gate walking and unveiled this marker which is still there today uh, in the centre of uh, Buckingham Palace gates. So we had created a moment, out of a moment, uh, for walking, to get people outdoors and it, you know this sounds like it would be this fantastic ego trip, but really, I'm trying to get back to that point. The reason why I showed you those pictures of me and my cowboy hat and my uh, on my Duke of Edinburgh award is about getting people out and appreciating that you don't necessarily need to go to the Chilterns, uh, to the Downs, uh, to appreciate the the smell of the fresh air outside and and the benefit and the happiness rating that you can get from just being out and about uh, and noticing nature. And so. You know, from your point of view, if we were looking at how we would measure these things and we were to get a university involved, we would be able to say we had, yes, we had activity, you know, 8 million people on that walking network a year, and every year it grows by nearly a million people. You know, phenomenal success. But do you ever see that in the papers? No. Um, from a Transport for London point of view, bearing in mind I had to persuade the mayor to give me my budget out of the transport department. Um, They've got no interest in recreation, even though those journeys could have been made by car. What I managed to prove was, although people were originally walking in their spare time, uh, when they weren't having to get somewhere, they were just walking for the sake of walking. Over the, the, uh, the nine year period, they started to use it, even if it was the most connected and convenient way, as the most reliable, attractive, safest, social, way of getting around the city. 75% change from recreation to transport, which was fantastic to be able to justify that money. Again, never been proved before. Um, why we didn't shout more about it, you know, but couldn't we replicate this example in so many other places? Wouldn't that be great with transport cash? Um, and uh, yeah, we've got a lot of people coming to the website. And, and what it proved to me, I think, more than anything, was that um, people are not lazy. I think we, we often label people as imagining that they've got all these iPads, they've got these phones, they, they've, um, they've got these wonderful cars that you know, can take them every, all these places. Provide people with the right environment and the right support, people do go. And I, I've been really impressed every time that uh, when we provided facilities, people should turn up. We've never had to worry about the fact that these things aren't popular. The, the trick is really about making sure you have a good enough uh, message at the beginning and you're going places where people want to go before you decide where you're going to put it. Oh, look at that. Isn't that good? <laughs> um, more recently, uh, the data has got even better and I am grateful for people like uh, the university here who've really forced government to actually start measuring some of the emotional things and uh, detailed things that have been quite hard to get a grip on uh, at, until now because does it really matter? You know, people know how to put one leg in front of the other so uh, as far as I'm concerned they're still doing it. Uh, does it matter, you know, how much people are going to the countryside or walking with a dog? You know, 1.4 billion people walking with a dog uh, every year in, um, in, in Britain. Do you see lots of organisations promoting dog walking, or uh, would you like to join my dog club? Or does that, you know, what, what's the social response to that understanding of that market? Um, 
if if people are playing with children, 235 million visits a year, the seaside compared to the towns and cities, the numbers of places where people are actually choosing to go, what they're also spending money on and what they're motivated by. These are things that are, are allow us, coming back to that slide about the economy before, and thinking about it more as a business, allows us to start thinking that we need to connect up the people where 54p of every pound is being spent on food and drink with the people who are charging, not, you know, who are getting a 9p benefit of that pound to getting in, into somewhere, with the people who are only getting 4p out of the equipment. All the messages we get about buy one of these, have one of those, get three of these with this, with this package. How does that put it all together and relate to the outdoors uh, as we know it and how we choose to make decisions and where we choose to, to go? and who we, who we share it with. And, uh, and what's interesting is that there are some people who are floating to the surface trying to join these things up now uh, for the first time, trying to broker a relationship between the rather fragmented, uh, rather difficult um, world that seems to have evolved. Do you know who this is? <laughs> Lover or, or, or hater, she is somebody, this is Julia Bradbury, and she has floated to the surface uh, rightly or wrongly, as somebody who is a face of the outdoors. And what the BBC found um, was that there wasn't really anybody representing the outdoors in, in its roundness beyond the, uh, the appeal of uh, a slightly more structured scientific end. Maybe I'm coming back to my arts science point. I don't know Julia's qualifications. <laughs> But what I do know is that she lives in Notting Hill, she holidays in Miami, um, mm -hmm. and yet she still walks the Pennine Way and the coast to coast and the canal walks and everything else and seems to have a mass appeal. And what I'm quite fascinated by her is, is the fact that she, I think, represents what actually a lot of us are, which is more complicated than the original marketing segmented approach that says you're either one or the other. You're either this outdoorsy type, you know, and you've got sandals and whatever, or you are, you know, your your urban person, you know, you're dressed in which way, you know, people are trying to get you in a box quickly, and and she uh, has just left the BBC, and there's just been uh, a whole team has just gone over to ITV, and they're starting to think much more differently about how the outdoors could be repackaged in this country in a way. Uh, not just with Julia, I think, but with, with some other people, about how to, how to make that appeal work. Uh, and I think you'll see in the next uh, probably 18 months, people like her as personalities who are willing to uh, maybe reach to people that haven't maybe been reached, particularly before, in, in, in more open ways. Uh, and, and I think it'll be interesting to see how that works. Again, we could, we could go for a tangent around that, but uh, let's not do it right now. Uh, some more meaningful moments for me in the future. Uh, I, I wasn't too involved in the Iron Curtain Trail, but you know when the Iron Curtain came down, they said, "What are we going to do with this no man's land uh, between the east and the west?" They they decided the only thing they could agree on was to convert it into a trail. You know, isn't that a fantastic story? And you can cycle that, you can walk that, and uh, if you've got nothing to do this uh, summer and you've got your lovely six weeks coming up, uh, I'd recommend getting a grip on that, it tells a story of nothing else. Uh, I was in, uh, oh, that, well just, just one other point to make because we're short of time, I was in Iran a few weeks ago. Uh, things have, are changing politically in Iran, uh, borders are coming down, they're a nation of people who like to walk, they've got the most beautiful mountains. It wasn't easy to get in, uh, in terms of visas and things, but uh, the mayor of uh, Tehran signed the International Charter for Walking. Uh, he wouldn't shake my hand on stage, I wasn't allowed to wear a tie with him uh, and be in the same room. However, he, he wants walking to be part of the future for the way that the city and the country evolves. Because they recognise if they can get the walking right, and their love of the mountains actually working in the towns, it could be part of the process that, uh, that, that helps rebuild a relationship with the West uh, and, uh, and actually gets things better in terms of the ridiculous levels of air pollution that are happening in, in, in the city itself. And so there's more moments coming up. Uh, and I think there always are. And I think if you, you think about your own moments, I suspect you, you'll have plenty that you think, uh, 
yeah, we could do something out of that, or maybe there's an opportunity there. And as I was saying to Ian over lunch, I love those moments and trying to work out when the next one might come or being ready because, you know, we've all got these sort of tools and I think there's so many guidelines out there. There's so many people who've written through the, the all the idea of uh, things that you can do in the outdoors or how to make it work, how to make it pay, how to get more visitors, uh, how to design things accessibly and, and helpfully. I, I don't think that's where we are right now as, as needing a lot more of that. It, it's not about evidence, it's about relevance. Uh, I think, and, and it's then thinking uh, that if we are to get that right, you know, how do we apply these things, and how do we apply the appropriate? I, I had a, I pretend it's a coffee moment, but the, the next three maps are, are are quite important for me. I love maps, uh, and and these three maps really have are influencing where I would like to direct my time next, and so I have let go of so many different things, and I'm trying to focus on where I think if I've got. 15 years left of trying to leave something behind that is going to be as positive as possible. Um, I want it to influence this map, which is about physical activity or inactivity, actually. Uh, because on average around the world, we're about 35% of people are not now doing enough to benefit their health uh, on a regular basis. Some places are a lot more than that. Uh, but on average, we're about 35%. And this epidemic is causing all sorts of issues, but the evidence couldn't be stronger than the health evidence. So whether the currency that you're attached to is something around uh, carbon, clean air, uh, loneliness, mental health, it, you know, there's plenty of things that being outdoors and, and happiness and the other things maybe that we've talked about, um, physical inactivity is now known to be uh, as bad for you as smoking. And I think if you've sat all day at your computer doing your Facebook in between your, your emails, in between your dissertations, whatever, you may as well have smoked 40 cigarettes. And now that people have worked that out, they're thinking, actually, we've got to do something about this. And, and I've been using that over the last few months to set up something called the Outdoor Trust. Uh, you know, we've only been going for about a year. We're trying to work out how we can do something meaningful about this. Uh, and we are very up for anybody who would like to join us. It's a charity. I'm a trustee. Uh, I don't get paid. We have got no paid members of staff. But we, we're, trying to, we're trying to ride on something, on some energy and some data and some evidence and try to create something that we think is going to help. Um, the second map that has really influenced me, I said there's only one more, is, is the fact that the world feels like it's shrinking. Uh, within 48 hours, you can be within you can be at 90 percent of anywhere in the world within 48 hours. This is extraordinary, really. You know, you don't have to speak to people who are that old to be able to tell you. You know, they used to take ships across the <laughs> Pacific and things. It's still a lovely way to it, obviously cruise around the world, but um, the world is a much smaller place. Uh, and as one of my kids is planning to be in India in, uh, in a few months' time, one of my kids has been for two years riding motorbikes around Asia and, uh, and, and is studying to be a diver over somewhere around here at the moment. I don't even know which country he's in. Mm -hmm. I sort of feel that one email, they're only one email away and potentially a flight and a half and I'll be there if I needed to. And there's something that just brings things together that means that I think, and there are things, a lot of things written about this recently, how uh, we are, we've become international citizens and also very local. I think that maybe we're lo we've lost touch so much about that sort of national side of things, maybe. But we feel a bit more global. Uh, everything feels a bit more connected and a bit more possible. And, and I was particularly thinking about that when I was, I've, I've been watching this, and I don't know if any of you guys have, um, I've been seeing this Queen's Baton Relay. I mean, they've been doing it for nearly 60 years. But this particular Queen's Baton Relay for the Commonwealth Games is happening here up in Glasgow in July this year. Did anyone even know that? You heard about it? Yeah. Um, so this baton has been pinging its way around the Commonwealth. The Commonwealth itself, uh, and if you had to sort of pick it on a map, you may not even know what is in the Commonwealth. A bit like when the Falklands hit, to be honest with you, I didn't know that we even owned the Falklands. So once you start looking at a map of the places that we've had connections with it, it's, it's quite an interesting part of the world. But 71 nations were joined up in the Commonwealth. Altogether, that is 
two billion people, that's 30% of the world's population, are united by the fact that this baton lands, they do a little walk, and then it goes back, just one baton goes back on the plane or to the next country, and then people do a little walk there. <clears throat> and I thought, well, that's great, but you know, it's only whoever's touched the baton that, and happened to be there that particular day. Uh, and, uh, and then you've got to wait another four years to another Games, and you know, if you even just get a chance to see it, let alone actually do some physical activity yourselves. Um, as, uh, as one minister said to me, the, thing, the problem with Commonwealth Games, Olympics and everything else is that it's full of people who should be doing more exercise, watching people who really don't need to do any more exercise. Uh, and, and I was just sort of coming back to that physical activity, I wonder if there was something that we could do to actually leave a permanent trail every place where that Queen's Baton uh, lands next time it's going to go around. So we put a marker down in the ground, we, do a, we, we actually permanently map a route, we leave it as a legacy route, we promote that trail in all 71 countries, and we, we give people who are living in urban areas, so just like that urban network that we had in London, we give them a route that could be used that connects up the best of the Commonwealth. Uh, wouldn't that be an amazing thing? Um, I designed this two nights ago, this logo. <laughs> uh, I was with the, the uh, Commonwealth Games team in Glasgow last week, selling anything I could to say, please, please, how about this idea, what do you think? And we'll see. Uh, but it's using up all my available energy and time at the moment, imagining that, you know, it's not far off, it, it should be possible. And if we use, if we work through the sport and the health department, we could put the sort of idea that we have in this country of trails um, as being something that we all choose to do and walk around, uh, you know, accessible routes as something that we could we could leave as a legacy in all 71 countries uh, and join up and make us all feel part of something that is about an appreciation for the outdoors and, and making that better. The Queen has approved the concept already. Uh, what I need to now do is raise probably about £10 million and uh, go to 71 countries and get on with it. But, um, so if, I'm not, if I can't make the next one, you'll know it worked. <laughs> and if I'm back here, then we'll come up with another idea and I'll be grateful for your ideas. So the last thing I'd leave you with, though, because uh, this is what's occupying me now, is it, three, three messages and, and one, one plea, really. Um, the number one message is, is that I don't believe in, in my career is that uh, the people are lazy and stupid, at least not all of them, and actually give them the right support and the right environments. I think people will choose to do the sustainable thing. Uh, and I think that glass half full is a much better starting point than imagining we've got to somehow rather persuade people to be more sustainable. I think, actually, I'd be beating people up with carrots and saying, isn't it great that so many people are so sustainable? Second thing uh, I would say is that uh, most of the lateral evidence, uh, or, or what we really would appreciate, is more lateral evidence to join up around the vertical ways that governments, departments structure themselves. So if I was sitting in DCMS as opposed to DEFRA, as opposed to Department for Transport or Department of Trade and Industry, all of them are relevant to get right across government. But if uh, if Natural England encourages people to walk a national trail and that saves people's health uh, and saves a budget on the National Health Service, uh, how's that relationship? Or if I get Transport for London money to pay for a walking route that gets people to leave their car behind so that congestion is improved and air pollution is better, which is a target for TfL, uh, nobody sees these benefits. I can't string them together. And I'm, I'm desperate for organisations who are willing to work laterally across the organisations which, but right or wrong, just are more vertical. Uh, and, and thirdly, you know, this, I can't say enough about this sort of, these moments, when you, when you attach yourself to a moment, much as I could have stayed a ranger and been having a lovely life and be probably a lot thinner, enjoying those trails and, and being outdoors and probably met lots of people and, and learnt a lot more about uh, British wildlife. For me, uh, if you can hang yourself onto one of those memorable moments and make them more of it, I think it, it's a lot of fun. And I've really enjoyed that, and I hope I've, uh, I, I've helped share that with you. But that relationship between uh, getting people aware, active, and grateful is ultimately what it's all about for me. Uh, and so from that moment I went to Iceland, if not the moment I was playing around 
with my cap gun and my shield and my and uh, my little hat in the in the woods. It, it was about being aware that you were enjoying yourself outside, and that enjoyment and that happiness isn't something that I think we should we should hide behind by making it too scientific uh, or come up with a whole load of language that stops people from feeling connected back to that feeling that was actually a really nice thing. Thank you.